This is the Own It Show, where we tell stories of how everyday people made ownership theirs to create extraordinary success. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Own It Show Coach Conversations, because we know that's where the best conversations are had. I'm Justin. And I'm Elise. Welcome to the show. And guys, I know it's it's so often, we. I'm sure every listener out there has seen a TED Talk or seen a TEDx Talk or been inspired by some keynote at the front of the stage. And oftentimes you're like, man, how hard would it be to get up there and give that talk? What have, what have they done to be able to do this? And the more that you kind of are around the types of people that organize these events or get these types of events together, you start to realize that they are around these types of people all the time. And what does it take to be one of those people or What impact do those people have on everybody else that they touch? And so today our guest is really going to be able to shed some light on that because not only is she a TEDx speaker herself, but she's a TEDx producer. Like she's the person that puts these things on and not the ones that get put on with like a little dinky ring light. Like I'm talking like Super Bowl halftime show, lighting, staging at Wrigley Field, Field, like big freaking deals. Um, She's just an all around badass, uh, law professor at Northeastern, uh, an author, and ultimately coming out with a masterclass on weaponizing empathy and how do you utilize that to your advantage. And so I, I, ca- I cannot be more excited to introduce you guys. Ms. Sherman Cruz, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's so wonderful to see the two of you again. I haven't seen you since the retreat. I know I was going to say, I haven't seen you since we were posted up on the back of Mel Gibson's home overlooking Costa Rica. (laughs) Yes, it's funny because we chose to do yoga on his helipad. And we all thought it was the coolest thing in the universe to do yoga on the helipad of Mel Mel Gibson's house. But the yoga instructor just kept complaining about how uneven the surface of the floor was. (laughs) The rest of us like, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't even notice it. (laughs) Until someone goes into like a handstand and just starts toppling over and falling (laughs) off the helipad because of the Slight chance of death, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Keeps it interesting. (laughs) That's right. I love it. I love it. Well, Sherman, you've got such a unique story. And I know I've been watching Elise night after night uh, read your book and the journey that you've been on and the impact that you have is something that I think drives what you do every single day now, uh, drives the type of person you are, allows you to have the impact that you do. And I'd love for you just to share a little bit of that journey with our audience so that they can understand who you are and what's made you you to be able to impact the way that you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's probably true for almost everyone, right? It's our experiences combined with our will that make us make us who we are. I feel that I've had an incredible, incredibly blessed life. I mean, I genuinely feel that I've been given one gift after another, but it's not been a life without adversity, you know, like a lot of other people. So I was born in Iran. I was born about two years before the Islamic Revolution. The year was 77 when I was born, 79 was the revolution. And then the Iran-Iraq war, Iran went to war with its neighbor Iraq, it was a land uh, land war in 1980. And that war took about 10 years and killed about a million people. There was only 40 million people in Iran at the time. So one out of every 40 people died. And it was a very, very extended war and very civilian casualty heavy because a lot of the Iraqi government just really had no qualms about sending blasts, rockets uh, into the cities. And candidly, neither did the Iranian government. I'm not trying to glamorize one versus the other. It was just a very bloody war. So there was a lot of, you know, what you're seeing on TV right now going on in Ukraine, very sort of similar, where you're in bunkers a lot, you're in basements a lot. We didn't have the internet back then, so we learned from television. I think we had half hour of literacy and half hour of new mercy every day. And uh, on the days that we were in the bunkers, and then when the skies were clear, we would try to get to school. So those those were my days growing up as a kid. And, you know, living under the Islamic Republic, particularly right when the revolution happened, was a very challenging, but also weird and interesting time because a lot of people did not support the the way in which the government was ruling. 
And we're living completely differently right before the change happened, right? Because suddenly alcohol is illegal. Suddenly women have to cover their hair. Suddenly you you can't even sing solo if you're female. So there was a lot, and, and it's not as though the population grew into that, right? It was, in many ways, it was overnight. And so it was this kind of wild time of people living these double lives where it was one life on the surface of com- being compliant with the Islamic rules of the government while managing the war. And then another life beneath the surface of kind of trying to get away with as much as you could get away with. And as a child, trying to sort of navigate those two lives without getting your family into trouble was um, was very, very interesting. I think it really taught me to value family and loyalty from a very young age. I just knew where my ties were and I knew whose advice I needed to follow. And it because of that dynamic, I think. And then when I was around 11, my family was granted permission to leave and enter, leave Iran and enter Canada. So we left, we were able to leave legally, but we had to leave, you know, almost everything we had behind. So we had to financially, economically start over for my parents, linguistically, you know, both my parents were, you know, 10 years older than the two of you are when we moved. So imagine, you know, and then culture shock and, and uh, political shock and just, you know, lots of big differences. But, but thank God we were able to, to get out and to move and wound up in Canada, which was a very strange experience because suddenly you had all these freedoms that you didn't have before, but you no longer had your network, you no longer had your family, your cousins, your home, right? Your streets, nobody spoke your language, you couldn't communicate with anyone. Nobody knew how smart you were, right? Because you can't, you can't articulate your thoughts. And so it was a whole host of of new challenges and then dealing with immigrant poverty on top of that. We we were so lucky we lived in mixed income housing. So we got to go to a really, really great school. But everybody at that school was financially well off. And so that was that was another challenge, right? When your your economic status is beneath the status of everyone else that you that is in your educational institution. But again, it taught you loyalties, you know, every night you come home to your family and they love you and they're there for you. My family always was. And that's a gift, right? I didn't earn that. That's just what I was born into. And my, uh, my home was, I mean, it was the sort of thing where it's always a little too cold in the morning to get out from under the covers because of the heating bill, but we always paid the heating bill. You know what I mean? And so the, the, that's the distinction right there. We never had to go without heat. We could never eat at a restaurant. McDonald's was a splurge. But we always had home cooked meals that my mom made. And so we always had food in our bellies. We always had a warm coat. We always had, you know, we always had sort of like those necessities that you need. The house always had books in it. And and so and I had my sisters and I had my parents. And so I sort of grew up in this warm nest of family togetherness and loyalty and it really, it really did make me who I am. And it was also, you know, when you leave, you have like survivor's guilt because a bunch of people didn't get to leave. So now you're in this place and they're all still over there. So there's this constant feeling that is very much accentuated by your immigrant parents about you have to make something of yourself. I mean, they gave up everything, right? I mean, they gave up their soil and their money and their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and their houses and their careers and their language and their way of life. So you better make something of yourself. So there's this sort of constant expectation, which in some ways, some people resent. For me, I thought it was wonderful because failure was just not an option. And by failure, I don't mean losing at something, right? I don't mean getting fired from a job. I mean, giving up because that's true failure. I mean, obviously, when you're living under those circumstances, you're failing every day, right? I can't communicate. I can't, can't get good grades. I can't. And then as you get older, because I'm, I'm just the sort of person who puts herself out there all the time, you, you kind of fall all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. So it's the getting back up again. And the, the, the fact that some people just refuse to get back up again, that was just was never an option for us, for me and my sisters. It just was not the environment that we were born into. And it is not the people who we became. So, yeah, so I would say those are the positive ways in which in which that adversity has shaped me. And I think a lot of people would say adversity builds resilience, right? I mean, we obviously, and it's such a weird thing as a parent because you don't want to 
expose your super hyper privileged children to adversity intentionally to teach them resilience. But, you know, in some ways you kind of have to because, you know, otherwise they won't build it. And so, yeah, so I'd say that's, that's my, my, the short version of my story, I guess. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And you're absolutely right. You know, there's something I want to point out in what you said, and you actually said it twice was um, how blessed you were and how wonderful your upbringing was. And then you went on to talk about actually from the outside looking in what appears to be a really challenging upbringing. But at the end of the day, all of your needs were met, right? From an external perspective, all of your needs were met. It wasn't, it wasn't like you were living in a lap of luxury, but all of your needs were met. And where the, the wonderfulness comes in is in the rich connection you were able to, to cultivate with your family. And at the end of the day, that's what's really important. The other thing I want to Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm interested in what you're saying. I just wanted to say some of that was an illusion. For instance, my need for safety wasn't met, but I thought it was because my parents were so calm all the time. My need for education wasn't always met, but it worked itself out because I eventually caught up. You know what I mean? So I think it's sort of having that safety net you know, really thinking of it like a trapeze artist, having that safety net every single time, every single time. And sometimes you're not, sometimes you're not safe, but, but there's somebody there who at least makes you feel that way. That is an extraordinary gift. It absolutely is. And that's one of the things I want to hone in on next is understanding how you and your family were able to cultivate that mindset in the face of things that were really hard and really challenging, because that's something that a lot of people face and a lot of our listeners face today, particularly entrepreneurs and people who are starting their own businesses who are, you know, not certain they're going to, they're going to hit their next, their, their next uh, rent check or pay their, their employees. Right. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that living in the, in that entrepreneurial life, uncertainty is real. And, and for you growing up as well, uncertainty was real, but you were able to cultivate this, this really strong ownership mindset of being able to, to cultivate this safe environment. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about how you cultivate that mindset? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, first, I want to acknowledge that some of it is just plain luck, the fact that the rockets didn't hit our house. I mean, there was a few times where it came so close that the window panels came out of the walls and it could very just as easily have been us. So some of it is just pure luck. I think just not getting hit by a car when you cross the street today. I mean, some of it is just pure luck, but not most of it, honestly. There, there is an element of, of that, but most of it, for us, what we value, what I value, what I've learned from my family and from my experiences to value are really just like two things. First is compassion, is to care, whether it's for yourself, for your family, for your community, for your globe, for the earth, for your business. And second is hard work, the ethic of hard work. I think if you have those two things, you really are pretty much set in life, regardless what your path is. Because as long as you live life full of labor and effort, and you guys are tremendous athletes, so this actually translates very well into athletics as well. You know, you you have to believe that your effort will make a difference. You have to believe that. And the reality is that it does. It doesn't make you win every time. You know, again, the, the athletics parallel, right? You're gonna, there's some games you're gonna lose, but the harder you try, the more likely you are to win. And what happens to some people is the losses are so demoralizing that it results in a reduction of effort. And then the reduction of effort results in additional losses. And then God help you if you stop caring. Because once you stop caring, or once you've sort of embraced the identity of, you know, I'm not a winner, or I'm not going to win this one, or whatever it is, again, nothing in life is guaranteed, but you've now significantly lowered your likelihood of success. But more importantly, you've eradicated joy from your life because so many people talk about success and I don't really even know what that means because success to me might be completely different than success to someone else. But for me, success is living a fulfilling life full of 
wholesome joy. So not momentary, I love to dance, I love to go out, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the kind of joy I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of joy that fills you with purpose. So you have to care and you have to care for those around you to have that same, same fulfillment as well. And then you have to work at it. Now, whether that's your business or your marriage or your, all, any of your relationships or your body or your diet, whatever it is, it all sort of flows together. So those are my two core tenants in every aspect of life. No, it makes so much sense. And I think for you guys listening out there, if you missed it, something that Sherman said that really kind of hit home with me when we talked about this resilience, she's talked about adversity and difficulty creates resilience. And over the course of time, the two things that you're going to lean into compassion and work ethic or hard work, the losses drop your work ethic. And that pattern only now drops our standard of what we get. And yes, drops the standard of the results that we get. And that is when we ultimately have reached rock bottom. When we failure is just not giving up. It's not getting up at the end of the day. And so if we can figure out a way in which we can continue to have the faith and believe that what we're doing makes a difference. What we're doing is going to create a win. What we're doing is just a part of the journey. And if we can fall in love with that journey and keep leaning into it, it's going to get us to that really, really powerful place um, that, that Tremaine was able to ultimately realize herself. I'm curious about a word that you, that you talk about and empathy is something that has been so, um, preached, I think, over the past three or four years. And quite frankly, I think it's taking a, taken a different meaning than the powerful world, the, the powerful word that it actually is. And I'm curious, kind of going into your masterclass, what you're kind of talking about within tactical empathy, what does empathy mean to you? And what does tactical empathy have to do with how you can ultimately deploy it into your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I'm obviously so excited about this topic. I teach it at Northwestern Law School. I'm launching a masterclass about it. I just gave a TED Talk on it. Um, Y'all tune in and listen. So to really simplify it, there are two kinds of empathy. There is cognitive empathy and there is emotional empathy. And they're really, really different from one another, even though most people don't really think of the distinction. Emotional empathy is literally feeling the emotions of another person. So you see someone in distress, you're distressed, right? You see a car accident, you don't feel the window shattering against your face, but you feel distress by watching that distress, even if it's on TV. Could right? that be considered getting into the ring with them? Yeah, sure. I mean, getting into the ring, literally adapting their emotional stress as your own emotional distress. Whereas cognitive empathy has no emotional connection requirement whatsoever. Cognitive empathy is you're an alien empath who just landed on planet Earth and you have the magical ability to read people's emotions and thoughts. You just know, you have the knowledge of what other people are thinking and feeling. But you're not feeling it yourself. And this is a really significant distinction because one of the things we, we do in tactical empathy is we help those who are in a more powerless position in the negotiation level up their negotiation power through cognitive empathy. Because it's possible that you are so you have so much less power than your opponent that feeling their feelings isn't necessarily what you need in that situation, right? What you need is to understand those feelings so that you can utilize them in the negotiation. And then what's really important is being able to formulate how close is this relationship, right? Is this person my husband? Are they my boss? Are they my colleague? Are they my longtime vendor? In which case, how much emotional empathy do I want to input into this discussion? Because I value the relationship more than I value how I come out in this deal, right? And so doing that analysis. So I always, I always say, look, if, if you're negotiating against someone in a hostile takeover of your company, you don't need any emotional empathy. But if you're negotiating with your spouse over, you know, whose family's house to spend the holidays, you do. You need lots of it. So sort of understanding those differences, because as we learn how to make people come around to our way of thinking through empathy, which a lot of people are naturally, you know, kind of good at, 
we also need to be very, very mindful of how that will impact our relationships going forward. But to be candid and honest, you know, again, you know, I grew up as an immigrant, a, a woman, a person of color, a person who was poor. I was often in a powerless, powerless uh, position compared to the person I was negotiating against. And I had to find a way to level up. And this is how I did it was by asking the questions, the right questions, observing body language, extracting as much information as I could about the other person so that I can get the other person to connect with me and give me what I want. So that's basically what tactical empathy is. I mean, it really is weaponizing empathy. A lot of um, FBI interrogators use it against hostage takers, you know, but also teachers use it in the classroom. Waitresses use it to get better tips. I mean, it's so it, it's it's very multi-use in a lot of ways. I think it actually has a huge place in the workplace as well, because there's there's still this thing that happens at the end of the day when you understand what someone's going through, you're just far less likely to be angry at them for whatever position they have. So you might not be feeling their feelings, but when you understand them, it overall reduces conflict all around while still helping you gain the advantage that you needed in that negotiation. You know, it's really such great advice. And, you know, one of the things that that I know at my core, but as I go through times of challenge or adversity is come back to empathy, right? Whether it's in my career with, with you know, a, a partner or someone on our team or, you know, somebody I may have a more difficult relationship with or a friend who's going through something really difficult or even with Justin and myself, if we find that we're not on the same page, we come back to it and it's it, and it's being able to use that empathy. And at times, oftentimes it's it's that cognitive empathy that you're talking about, but even going a level deeper into that emotional empathy to be able to create change within that situation, to really just connect with somebody on another level is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you use the word powerful because it is right. It is. It's a power. It's a superpower. And I find a lot of people look at the word empathy as though it's this kind of soft skill, but it's actually not. It's it's really kind of incredible. Again, imagine you're an alien who just landed on Earth and can just like magically knows what people are feeling and thinking when you talk to them. Right. They say no. You know that they mean yes. Right. Or they are negotiating in the sales agreement and you know that it's their last one and that this is going to be their legacy and that they're going to care a lot more about how they look in this one than they have in any other ones. Or, you know, that that the person that was representing your company right before the year before lied to these guys a bunch of times. So now they're not going to trust anything you say. You just it's just information. Right. It's just information about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, why they're hostile, why they're angry, why they and then using that to diffuse the anger, calm them down, get them to be connected to you and get you what you want. I, I was just going to say it's so often empathy is seen as weakness and it's seen as this, this shy, meek, standoffish, people can take advantage of you. And there's this quote that um, uh, I, I keep going back to, and it says, don't mistake my empathy for weakness, but rather understand that the power lies within me because I've chosen it. And I think that heightened level of awareness, that ability to lean into your empathy and understand what's going on really allows you, like you said, to have the upper hand because you're going to be able to change the situation. You're going to be able to change the conversation, change the thought patterns, change the beliefs that are going on and be so aware to the detail of what's going on there that at the end of the day, you're going to get exactly what you want. And to be able to be in control of that engagement, whatever that engagement is. And so I think that's something that for all you listeners out there that you can start to understand that doing this in your business, doing this in your relationships, doing this in your parenting, doing this in the way in which you talk with uh, coworkers, the way in which you're uh, selling your culture within a, within a company, within an organization, within a team, it all stems back to this tactical empathy that Sherman is talking about. Yeah. So Justin, you hit on some really fascinating things. And this is where my, my passion and love for stoicism comes in. So like you said, empathy, really any kind of information, right? Access to any information that you didn't have before is power. Awareness is always power. 
but we want to make sure it's also control. And people fear that emotions will force them to lose control and that their emotions will cause them to give in when it would not be in their, inter- in their best interest to do so or fair to do so, right? Whether the emotions are fear or love or anger or surprise, hatred, whatever they might be. And that appears to be a big concern of a lot of people. And this is where the teachings of Stoicism come in, which is the next course I wanna build, is feeling emotions and not having control over your emotions are two completely different things. We can in fact lead and should lead rich, fulfilling emotional lives while remaining in control of our emotions. And a lot of your listeners will relate to this because they're leaders in their institutions. So as a leader, when COVID hit, did you cry on a daily basis in front of your employees? No. But did you have empathy for what they were going through? Yes. Would your organization have succeeded if you didn't understand what each person was going through? No. But would it have similarly succeeded if you yourself were a complete emotional wreck? No, right? I mean, you just don't have the luxury of doing that because you're responsible for other people's jobs and you're responsible for an organization. Or if you're a parent, you're responsible for your children. How many parents out there have had a traumatic experience while being a parent, but had to remain calm? You know, I had, I went through a traumatic experience about three years ago. I couldn't just walk around the house, cry every time I wanted to. It would impact my children. So I had to, now, but could I completely ignore my feelings? No, I, I, would have, I would have completely gone destroyed from the inside out. So it's more like, you know, the tap on, on your nozzle, on your sink. You turn it on when you can. You reduce it when you have to. There's a rare circumstance where you, have, where you can turn it off entirely and it's okay as long as it's for a short period of time because then you got to be able to turn it on again. And knowing what those situations are and knowing how and when and how much emotion to express and release at any given time is part of the process of adulting. So for those who just refuse to like feel anything because they're so afraid of the water overflowing until they're in their 40s or 50s, man, they've missed out on 20, 30 years of emotional control training, right? So I get why they're afraid, but there, but there is a way to control it. And we do all get better at that as we get older. And then we sort of transition into these very rich, but very controlled emotional lives, which are, which are really where we want to be. I love how you use the word adulting and called it the idea of adulting because, you know, it's, it's something that I've really, t- I, I was that person in my twenties who was afraid to have this emotional overflow. So lived in a, in a very small window of a very short range of emotions, right? I didn't feel the high highs, but I also didn't feel the low lows, mm-hmm. but in order to become a more conscious version of myself and live in my own version of ownership. I had to go along this journey of, of learning out at learning about how I can control my emotions, but still live a very rich emotional life. I'd love Mm -hmm. if you could share with some of our listeners, a piece of advice on how they can do that themselves, because you're right. A lot of people don't realize that until they're 40 or 50, or for some people really never even at all in the entirety of their lives. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful growth. So I would say one piece of advice that's actually pretty easy, it's going to sound uh, a a little bit morbid, but it's not, is to be mindful of the possibility of death at any given time. And I know this sounds morbid, but it's not. The the Stoics love this. and, And I've always loved it. It's not that you live your life thinking you're going to die. It's that you live your life knowing that if you were to die, you would be pleased with the life you'd lived to that point. And and that awareness, that kind of constant reminder, and you can build literally times and and activities into your schedule that allow you to have that constant reminder. I write my obituary every year on my birthday. So what that does is it helps you realize, oh gosh, that hour long Facebook argument I just got into really was not how I want to live my life. You know, at the time I felt it was a matter of principle that I answer this person. But if I really were to think about it, right, it was a complete waste of my time. Right. And you're able to sort of engage in that analysis. And, and oftentimes it's a hindsight analysis, but that's okay because it helps you carry 
forward, right? You are then less likely to engage in Facebook fights than you were before. And not because you're perfect, you know, you're not going to be perfect. You're still going to be petty from time to time, but it does allow you to realign yourself on, on a daily basis and try to live a true life authentic to who you want to be, not what anybody else wants you to do, but what you want to do and who you want to be and how you want to be remembered once you've moved on from this earth. At the end of the day, it's your choice. So yeah. live it the way that you want to. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and, and don't forget, you don't have forever. You just right. don't. So make, make the best out of what you have today. Make the best out of it. And it's all a gift. Honestly, every moment is a bonus. It's so scary to think about something happening to you or to think about something happening to your children. I can't even, you know, as a mother, I mean, it makes your heart stop. A friend of mine lost her child in a car accident when she was 18. When the child was 18, she died, was killed by a drunk driver. This friend of mine celebrates every minute of her child's 18 years as a gift. It was all a bonus. You're not entitled to any of it, right? I mean, not more so than anyone else, not more so than any other. To the extent all humans are entitled to a long, healthy, happy life, that's wonderful, the universal human right. But you, doesn't matter how good or rich or healthy or thin or fat, doesn't matter who you are, it's, it's all a gift. It's all extra. So just use it, use it and be thankful for it and smile through it and, you know, do your best, do your best. Sure. It's so awesome to just like hear your perspective because it's, it really makes you think. And when, for you guys out there listening, just listening to some of these things that she's talking about in terms of uh, empathy and gratitude and uh, being able to live deep into every moment is, is, is it's thought provoking and it, it ch changes your perspective on a lot of things. And hopefully by consequence, your actions. And uh, Cher, I want to ask you as well, oh, something that again, our audience listens to and will continue to thought provoke, but what through your experience and through your, I guess now definition, would you say is ownership? Yeah, so I would say ownership in two words is stoic empathy. Stoic empathy, and what does that mean? Yeah, so living a rich, emotional, connected life that you are in control of. That is the combination of empathy and stoicism. And it's so funny because people think that they are polar opposites, right? Really, you think stoicism, you feel nothing. Empathy, you feel everything. But actually, stoicism is control over emotions, not the refusal to feel them. And empathy isn't feeling everything either because there's this whole other realm of cognitive empathy. It's really sort of just choosing to connect based on your understanding of other human beings. Those two things in combination with one another also produce the terrifying result of allowing you to understand yourself, which in, is so much scarier <laughs> than trying to understand other people. But you know, with a little bit of courage and a little bit of control and the reminder that every minute is another chance to do it better. Every minute is another opportunity to be just a little bit better, a little bit of a bigger person, a little kinder, a little harder working. And that chance is there for you right at this minute, just as it was a minute ago. It sure is. And, and thank you so much for, you know, providing those really amazing words of of guidance to our listeners because you're absolutely right. And Cher, you're so clearly somebody who lives in that ownership mindset and that ownership lifestyle. And I know Justin uh, listed off your, your extremely impressive resume at the beginning of the podcast. We've talked about it a couple of times, but you're also a mother of four as well, which does not come lightly. And it's clear that they are going to be amazing humans as well with, with a mother like you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Where can our listeners find you? Well, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And for those kind words, um, I, I'd love to tell your listeners where to find me really quick. I just want to throw, throw that compliment back at you guys. I mean, just 
what phenomenal human beings and what a gift it is to just be around you and to listen to you talk. And, you know, I, I just got to tell the listeners real quick, obviously at, at the retreat, you know, we're mostly listening because Justin and Elise have a lot of wonderful, amazing things to say. And you got to know when to close your mouth and open your ears. This is really the first chance I really had to do the talking. So it's been really fun for me, actually. But um, but I don't know if it's been more fun than doing the listening. I, I grew a lot from that retreat and I really appreciate that. Your listeners can just go to shamingcruise.com. That's probably the best way to get access to the tactical empathy material. But I'm also on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, I have a really fun Instagram page full of pictures of my kids and my dog. I don't know how much you're going to learn about tactical empathy there, but you might fall in love with my cute little mini golden doodle. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And guys, we'll have in the show notes where you can find uh, her masterclass as well as her TED Talks so that uh, you can follow along and get deeper in those areas um, uh, if if you so desire. And oh oh, and I I gotta say also the book that Elise is reading is called Butterfly Stitching, and it is a novel. It's loosely based on the stories of the women of my family before and after the Iranian Revolution. And if you guys buy it and read it, um, just please feel free to reach out and let me know what what you think. Um, you can find me on social, and I always lo- I always love it. Authors, all authors love it when readers write to them about their books. And someone who's halfway through it myself, I can personally attest it is a must read. <laughs> oh, thank you! I'm so honored you're reading it. Yeah, I love it, guys. So, as, listeners, as you kind of go on, it's it's something that we kind of figure out like what's shaping us, and it's a combination of our experiences and our will. And knowing that failure really only sets in when we choose to give up. And if we're on the ground, we want to stay there for a little while, own it, feel it, taste it, smell it, be down there, but then choose to get up that one more time because we don't know what that's ultimately going to do. Adversity and difficulty creates that resilience that allows us to find that success that is sometimes hard to find. And by doing that, we can combine the combination of empathy and stoicism to create the reality that is going to maximize not only ourselves and our life, but those people that we touch and that we're responsible for as well. So as we always know, success is different. So own your different. And we'll see you guys next week.